To start the program, I'd like to acknowledge Reading Elders from your country. So I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live, and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay respect to Elders, past, present and emerging, but also pay respects to all people of disabilities who are of our Indigenous communities. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Your Life, Your Voice. And my name is Julie Skibiris. Welcome, welcome Lisa Bickleach. Hello. Hi, presenter. Hi, Lisa. How are you? How are you doing? Good. That's good. That's good. So we'll we'll start the uh, we'll start off today with the acknowledgement to country statement. So D and D diversity and disability acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of which I work and live in Victoria and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay respect to elders, past, present and emerging. I pay respects to elders and I also pay respects to all Indigenous people uh, who, in, who are disabled and acknowledge that their um, their life expectancy in general, uh, in in comparison to the uh, rest of the population, is much lower. So uh, we pay respects to these indigenous communities. So today we have a guest speaker from the national from NIDA, National Ethnic Disability Alliance, and we welcome. We, welcome, we wish to welcome Dominic Golding. Hi Dominic, how are you, Hi. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, diversity and disability uh, YouTube um, event. So yes, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so Dominic Golding, has been an ex diversity disability committee member. He's done lots of lots of work in the area of refugee refugee advocacy, and he's well versed in his area. And now he's in Canberra. He's, he's in Canberra working with Nita in the policy area. So just to kick off, Dominic, um, can, can you tell us a little bit about your role with Nita, please? Yes, my role is the policy and project officer at NIDA. Um, I facilitate uh, and develop different programs uh, that target the cold population with a disability. Uh, I also feed into um, systemic advocacy work to the federal government, uh, the NDIS uh, and the Royal Commission on the concerns that cold people with a disability have when it comes to access and when it comes to getting the right supports uh, for themselves. Uh, we work across uh, um, state-based and territory uh, member organisations such as you know, Diversity and Disability in Victoria uh, to uh, make sure our members' uh, voices get heard and by the federal government who run certain programs for people with disabilities across the country. Currently, my role is actually uh, multifaceted, but at the moment it is to uh, work on the Disability Royal Commission, as well as to help manage and coordinate the, the now newly uh, funded project that NIDA has gotten uh, for the ILC project around um, resources for interpreters. Um, so that's a new program that we just developed. That's great, um, Dominic. So, Dominic, can you like tell us a little bit of some of the challenges you have in your work? Uh, some of my challenges has really been more about um, our my work feeding into issues that the cold community face. 
uh, to those working in the public service. Um, there's a very much a very cultural difference as well as um, certain class differences that, between uh, those who work in um, Geelong, such as the NDIS, or Canberra with the DSS and other aspects of um, policy work, where, um, of course, our members uh, live in either, you know, highly populated ethnic suburbs and face numerous disadvantages. And so that's one of our main challenges is to uh, educate um, the, the uh, public service and those who work to improve their, their systems and, um, and be more responsive. So a good example of this was um, around the COVID responses. Um, of course, government um, put out uh, to their to their benefit. They put out a lot of languages in other in, in, in languages other than English. A lot of translated fact sheets. Of course, um, it, we had to explain to them that um, you know there's another lot of work that needs to be done around COVID with cold communities and particularly those with disabilities to understand um, COVID and its impact on, on one's health and well-being and so forth. That, that's one example where um, my work has been um, uh, challenging at times, but it, it's a good challenge. I, I don't, I, I'm not saying that as, as, as a negative. Yes, so part of our role with, as you know, with diversity and disability and also the YouTube project is to sort of like empower people with disabilities to, to see to see like beyond the disability and to uh, to uh, to really um, reach their goals and aspirations so when you think about overcoming some ch challenges in your life how do you deal with that Dominic uh, my challenges uh, I have to say that from my work with the National Disability Reference Group on the NDIS uh, and also my work here. But um, I'll see that my challenges in everyday life um, in terms of access and equity is pretty um, not too bad. Uh, but I see that many of my peers and many, many of our cohorts actually have um, more pressing barriers because they are newly arrived, um, most of them, and uh, diagnosis around disability is, is quite um, complex and difficult. So um, unless you're a long-term migrant, like like myself and Julie, uh, we kind of know what the disability um, sector is like, but for those who are newly arrived, it's much more difficult. So I, I think in terms of me, it's, it's more, um, my minuscule, but it's also my barriers are, are more about um, social perception of deafness, um, social perceptions of, of cerebral palsy, and, and that well, correlation to you know aspects of what is able bodiedness in terms of you know um, for the majority of the population. So that they also have preconceived ideas and, and um, they have preconceived uh, stigma. Uh, so um, that's kind of the, the most that I have to do with is, is mainly attitudinal um, concerns that, that people have in the community. Yes, yeah, so uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's a huge barrier to face, uh, attitude, attitudes, uh, and uh, the disability sector uh, really uh, work hard on that, on that, uh, that topic just to break down the barriers of what people with disabilities can achieve in their life. So yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, so, um, so in your opinion, um, do you think the NIS is making a difference for people with disabilities? Um, can you please say that again, Julie? In your opinion, is the NDIS making a difference to people with a disability? Overall, um, I, I think um, considering the large intake of 
people been having their access requests accepted by the NDIS. Um, I, I believe it has been successful. Uh, that's purely on, on um, the, the quarterly report that comes through by the NDIS to, to the public. Many people with uh, disabilities um, who were not given support prior to, to the NDIS have been getting the, the ports in their plans and I think that's been successful. In terms of uh, the nuances around the NDIS in terms of how one uses their plan, uh, what to spend on it, uh, what the, uh, um, how to get the support coordination that you want, um, even particularly around, specifically with um, cold communities, we're dealing with ideas of language, we're dealing with ideas of, of what is a disability. So um, I think that's, a, that's been the real challenge for the NDIS is to, to transfer over from the mainstream disability thinking and ideas of disability over to how this system can support those who are vulnerable, those who speak a, a language other than English as their primary language, and also not for the NDIS to rely strictly on um, languages that are in print. So in other words, translation. So um, I think it's been, um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to, um, to ensure the numbers of cold people with disability is increasing. Um, it, it's slowly getting there, uh, but it's nowhere near the um, 20 to 25% of the population with a disability from cold background to access the scheme. Um, so we, we are hopeful that, that that will happen. But um, the NDIS is, is, is does things for different people in different ways. And it's a very personable improvement or a, a very personable um, disadvantage. And we need to acknowledge that the NDIS is not perfect. It is not um, going to reach everybody's expectation. There's a lot of um, uh, plan nuances and, and barriers that go in to the NDIS that can deny one person one set of services based on a ruling, but another person with um, another set of needs or at the same kind of needs might get greater access. So um, as we know, we've heard that many people from uh, many disabilities across the spectrum have had their plan cut. And we both also know that many people from disabilities have um, their plan doubled in increased funding. So I think there's a, there's a lot of um, complexity that, that's not really, um, the public doesn't really understand. So as a, as a concrete example, of a friend of mine um, has um, experienced a stroke episode. So she, she has um, a, a form of, of disability as a result of stroke. But the NDIS, as a ruling, has decided that um, her stroke would not X uh, for her to, in, in, or to get the NDIS plan. So um, that's an example or another example where I've heard from, from um, our member in Queensland is that um, just because you're a cold disability support service doesn't mean you're going to present the best service to those within your own community with a disability. So um, there's a lot of uh, uh, complexities around um, what the NDIS can do for people and how to, to maximise the benefits um, to, to you to participate in the community. Yeah, so that's interesting, Dominic. So I do some work around uh, with a group of parents, uh, of cold parents of people with disabilities, of children with disabilities. And um, uh, it's, it's really interesting because um, uh, some, some have uh, support coordination and some don't. And um, uh, there's been um, 
someone employed from the cultural uh, background who's I think has got great potential to address some of the access and equity issues due to language barriers. So, yes, yeah, so um, they're very passionate about their community. So anyway, so um, with that in mind, what's sort of like, in terms of support coordination with the NDIS, is that sort of like improving for people of disabilities from a cold background? Because I know earlier on in, in the scheme, uh, you know, first it was really for long and then there was cuts. People were telling me that they weren't, they weren't getting funded for support coordination. So where does it stand, do you think, at the moment? Uh, I really can't um, answer that one in terms of um, what, the, what the other people's experiences have been around support coordination. What I do know is that NIDA, uh, on behalf of many of our member organisations, had written to the CEO of um, Martin Hoffman uh, to, of, the, of the NDIS regarding um, the need for better support co coordination to be active in people's plans. Uh, but the response back from, from the NDIA has been one of um, polite uh, statements saying that uh, they acknowledge uh, the concerns that cold people with disability may have in needing and requiring um, support coordination. But as it stands from uh, their point of view, it, it, it is one where the individual still needs to individually advocate for the need to have support coordination in their plan. So they, they perceive support coordination to be one of choice um, and they see um, support coordination as one that um, one request in order, order for them to get the support that they, they need in, in determining how to use their plan. Um, I think there's still a basis where from the NDIA's perspective is that um, they're given the benefit of the doubt from my sensibility that, that if you're able-bodied enough with a disability, you do not need to um, have support coordination. So um, I'll let you actually specifically request it. That's yeah. one of the questions we bring up all the time at NDIA meetings, isn't it, Dominic? That's one of the things that comes up a lot. So, Alicia? That's one of the um, things that comes up all the time at NDIA meetings about the yeah. coal. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Dominic, what do you think needs to improve in the NDIS? Come again, sorry? What, 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 what do you think needs to be improved? With oh, the yes. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, I do apologise. I've got a hearing impairment. So, just as a, as a declaration to, to the viewer. Um, essentially, um, I think they need to uh, activate um, and put in uh, plans and measures that support the NDIS's uh, cold strategy. They've got a, a, a strategy online. Unfortunately, they have there's no actual um, uh, measurement or action plan going forward about how how they're reaching certain aspects of, of that strategy. Um, also, I think the NDIS needs to do a, a lot more with um, uh, branching out into the coal communities, but through active um, uh, culturally sensitive um, engagement practice. Um, an example of that is um, that I found that lacking is um, uh, the, there was an NDIS office, storefront office um, in Liverpool, Sydney. Liverpool, Sydney is in the West. It's very diverse. It has a, a really good, interesting pop, local population. Um, I went in there, and they had all the translated booklets and, and all that sort of thing. I asked the receptionist at the NDIS there with their shop front, um, do you have workers? 
unsought, who speak a language other than English. Their response was that no, they didn't. Um, you're, you just come in and you um, can have access to the telephone interpreter, um, which is a national service. Um, so I found this rather a, a very interesting that um, the NDIS is, is still effectively working like a mainstream um, bureaucratic government body, it, despite um, being in an area which is incredibly diverse, which is Liverpool. Um, so that's an example where the NDIS needs to do more than just providing translated material. They need to get out and engage with, with, with the community, um, which is hence why I think it's um, uh, NIDA, along with FECA, the Federal Ethnic Community Council, um, had got the um, National Community Connected Program. Uh, we are basically um, have uh, working with different organisations across the country in our respective states and territories to engage with the coal communities about the NDIS. Uh, so I, the, the NDIS is also needs to also put out, I believe personally and professionally, that the NDIS needs to, to also not take the word disability as, as, as for granted, as one that something that anyone from any background or religious background I can understand. Um, my conversation with many people in the communities and diverse communities is that the word disability is not a well-known understood term. Um, so that's, a, that's really a, a principal barrier to people with disabilities from cold background to understand A, what is the NDIS and B, um, what kind of disability supports are available for them in the community. Yeah, that's interesting because in my culture, there's sort of like a word for disability, like it's sort of like drawing on to another word. So, you know, I'm from a Maltese background. So like just say, it's like um, you're sick with, say, um, the disability with a heart condition. So there isn't really a specific word for disability. So the word sick is Marita, that's sick, with, you know, the, the, the joint on to the disability. So I think that that's a really important point for, um, for the, um, uh, for the um, NDIS to, to recognise and to uh, understand uh, that more clarity on um, definitions on disability uh, probably should, would be a good thing for the um, general population. Yes. So what, what would you like to see included, Dominic, in the National Disability Strategy? The strategy is currently being um, uh, in a consultation phase now for the next going forward. Um, the previous um, National Disability Strategy went for 10 years. Uh, it was kind of well, finished up in 2020, well, this is 2020. Um, so going forward, um, this, the government has uh, is engaging with uh, many people across the country around what should be the part of the next this part of the next disability strategy and um, my sense is that um, that the cold population with disability has not been re really um, acknowledged in the previous strategy um, subsequent documents coming out of that strategy there's been some some minor uh, acknowledgements about cold people with disability, but uh, for us, um, NIDA, we have been advocating that cold disability, um, we, though we may, we may be a minority, across the multicultural sector, multiculturalism also needs to be um, a, a serious factor in, in the, 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 the national disability strategy. The reason why I say that is because 
um, as you know from the census data, that 49% um, of the Australian population has a family member or a father or a mother or someone of their own background who has been either born overseas or is from a country that um, they don't speak in English as a, a first language. Uh, so that's a quite a significant um, uh, encapsulation of, of multicultural Australia that really hasn't been um, captured by the disability sector. And I think the national disability strategy going forward, this is the great opportunity for the government to embrace multiculturalism as part of the by government is that um, there's um, an acknowledgement to engage with the cold community, but also engage with cold people with a disability about their needs, their ideas about access, and what they think uh, will improve uh, aspects of people's lives that are kind of embedded in the pillars of, 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 the, of the disability strategy. So, for example, ideas about justice, um, education, access and in, in inclusion, um, employment. Uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, degrees where um, our needs to call people with disabilities can be quite different to those from mainstream Australia with a disability. So um, I, I'm positive um, so far. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that the uh, NDS will do a lot more to, um, as they have done with First Nations um, people with disability, is to acknowledge cold people with disabilities. Okay. So, Dominic, what do you like doing when you're not at work? And I know you work really hard, and I mm, know a few things about what you do. So, what do you like to do when you're not working? Well, a camper is, is actually um, a very uh, quiet, very lovely city. Um, so it's, it's very um, green. So I actually like to go um, mountain bike riding when I have the energy. I also um, taken up a, a, a sporting hobby to engage with the, the local community. So I've, I've kind of signed up to take up archery, which is um, also, that's also a self-therapeutic as well as a social activity. So I can concentrate on my strength and my breathing as a person with cerebral palsy. But it's also a great way for me to have a non-competitive, non-contact sport engagement. So, um, yes, and um, basically I um, also do a lot of reading and, and um, um, so forth. So that's what I like to do in my spare time. Wow, that's a, I learned a bit about you in Canberra. I know what so you like, like, Dominic. You like when we go away, you like going to shop for shoes. I've seen you come <laughs> back with a couple pairs of shoes in our meetings. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, you love your shopping. Yeah, I, I, like, I like to. Um, we are cast up bogan, so I like getting them. I know, because uh, I think uh, it was when we were in um, Brisbane last, you came back with a couple pairs of shoes into the meeting. Yes, yes, yes. Um, now that I, uh, yeah, I got a bit of uh, a spare cash, I like to um, be, uh, get, instead of, you know, other, other migrant communities like Louis Vuitton, and I like uh, fancy, fancy clothes, but I, uh, no, I, I'm still a country boy from Mount Gambia, so I, I, I like to uh, get my Nikes and my Adidas and uh, my, uh, you know, street quid, street quid, street quid clothes. So you have a bit of my chart, Lisa, uh, Krishna Sorin, but he's not very well known for his Italian uh, shoes, and he's a very well dressed man. So. Uh, mm -hmm. So it looks like Dominic is taking up that that sort of like that uh, sort of like uh, idea to be 
I saw Dog Leak in a suit recently and it was a bit of a shock. I was wearing in a Christmas suit. He looked like a spiffy in a suit. So congratulations on moving on to um, Dog Leak. So, yeah, I don't think uh, wearing a hoodie and some gangster gear would go down very well at the National Press Club in terms of uh, doing a media release for the uh, budget. budget. Um, so, yes, Julie, I had to dress up in a nice suit. That's fair enough. We have to do what we have to do, Dominic. <laughs> uh, but we, we know uh, from your heart, we know the real Dominic, don't we? <laughs> Oh, I know the real Dominic. I've been on a committee with him for now. How long is it, Dominic? Over 12 months? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's been great um, work, working together on the, at the uh, National Participant Reference Group with the oh, NEIS. Oh, I get to, it's good to catch up because then that way we don't all, like now, we don't always, because we're always talking about NDIA stuff and what could we make better and stuff like that. It's yes. good to talk about other things. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So, moving on, <laughs> other things. So, uh, what are your plans for the future, Dominic? Um, I have no real plans. Um, I'm hoping maybe um, doing more work and projects for, the, for NIDA. Um, I'm hoping to also, uh, with that experience, perhaps also um, see where the, the international path just may lie. Uh, there's so much work around that needs to be done around uh, um, refugee camps and disability. Uh, there's so much needs to be done around um, forcibly displaced people with disabilities. So um, I'm, I'm actually interested in perhaps looking at um, the international. Um, but um, at the moment, we, we you know we've got to make, try and find ways to make the system better and more easily accessible for those with cold people with disabilities, especially if they're. Um, uh, newly arrived refugees and, and asylum seekers with disabilities. So, um, interesting you should say that about, about international um, uh, focus because the brainchild for this YouTube channel, Yusuf, uh, who is on episode three, if you want to catch Yusuf, he's a, he's, a, he's a community connector for ECCV now, Ethnic Community, community Council of Victoria. And you know, part of his idea for this YouTube channel is to go overseas and to um, to bring back best practice and to sort of like do a bit of comparisons and um, and uh, look perhaps perhaps um, perhaps the Australian model is best practice. We don't know, but part of the vision for this though, but for this for this. Um, channel was that that particular point so um so and you know that can still happen in the future i mean th this is our first series of uh, the youtube channel so we encourage people are watching at the moment um to if you if you if you are if you think this channel is important to uh to make your views known to, uh, on the comment section so we can uh, we can so get a bit of momentum happening, and we can get some more funding for next year. So currently, this is a pilot project. So we're funded for ten sessions. Our last session will be uh, just before Christmas. So yeah, so uh, I think that Lisa and I were talking about it earlier. I think that this channel could have great reach and prospects because you know. We're online, so on demand, so people can like connect rather easily nowadays. So yeah, so for those of you out in YouTube world, keep that in mind and spread the word. Word, uh, if you're interested in in um, in uh, in uh, getting additional funding for next year. So that thanks, Dominic, for bringing that up. So anyway, so um, so how do you see um the cold people with disabilities in Australia having a Christmas?
for a ball. So what do you envision in 20 years' time, Dominic? <laughs> yeah, I'm the one that normally asks that question. Um, essentially, uh, I, th um, I hope that um, people, cold people with disability in, in 20 years' time in Australia can have the same rights and access and, and um, communities themselves, particularly within the, their own communities, have their, their, um, uh, their perceptions of disability has changed for the better. Um, I really do hope with more um, presence and, and advocacy around within the communities of disability that um, it will promote and uh, um, that everyone in the community should be able to participate in and have their goals and their wishes and their, their well-being um, met. So the, the levels of stigma I'm hoping will will drop away. Uh, yes, we do understand there's still a lot of disability stigma in the mainstream Australian population, but I'm also hoping that um, over time, um, all the diverse communities in Australia can address and acknowledge that uh, people with disabilities within their own communities have just as much of an equal right to as, as they do um, to get work, to um, have a relationship, to um, socialise with their peers. And that, I'm not talking about people with disabilities. I'm talking about people um, with disabilities from cold background being able to socialise with Australians and, and um, everyone in, in the community. So that's, that's what I'm hoping in, in 20 years time. So, Dominic, um, d and would like to thank you for your time. And thank you. It's been uh, great to uh, catch up again. And uh, you so, uh, so um, thank you, Dominic. You, you just, uh, so um, thank you once again for all your work in, uh, in this sector. Um, you're pretty full on, uh, so um, and we need more, more, more disability advocates like you um, around. So, congratulations on your work in Canberra, and we look forward to uh, catching up again. Thank you, Dominic. He's just muting himself. Okay, so I will just go on to um, our next segment, which we promised some, some information on uh, support. So um, I've, I found out on the uh, DHHS website that people with disabilities can, um, can get free masks. So it's widely recognised that people with disabilities who are on a disability pensions usually uh, are the most um, disadvantaged groups in society. So, um, so I'll just do a share screen with you guys and give you the information. This is the, uh, the link to the reasonable face baths for people with disabilities. And I'll just get into it so people can see. Okay, so Moving right along, so um, so the Department of Health and Health and Human Services will be distributing twenty one million re reusable face masks to agencies that deliver services and support vulnerable uh, Victorians to help slow the spread of coronavirus. So these are masks are free. So I would. I would uh, encourage people with disabilities to contact uh, their provider and to uh, ask for free face masks uh, as, as a basic right, human right. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's really important information for people with disabilities. I'll just do another shared screen. Let's have a look. Uh, 
So another thing we have to do is um, share. This is the last segment of our show. So, um, DD Your Life, Your Voice would like to thank the MRC Northwest, Northwest Management for their support they give to DD Your Life, Your Voice project. This YouTube channel is funded by the Victorian DHHS and Moreland City Council. Great job, guys. Thanks for the funding. DD would like to thank them for providing funding for this progressive out of the box project, especially in these times of living through the COVID pan pandemic. The COVID 19 has been a difficult time for people with disabilities due to um, isolation. So the, this channel is for them too. Um, we would like to thank our guest speaker for today and this project would like your ideas on what you would like us to explore on your life, your voice. Please feel free to email us on DD, your life, your voice at gmail.com. So this is the end of our, our program. So thank you for all for watching and we'll be with you for episode next episode in two weeks thank you thanks guys for watching